Isn't news a strange word? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, so I, I haven't looked at, into this at all. Like, I literally thought about it when I was making a coffee downstairs. But the etymology of news is pretty close to new. Yeah. And it is new information. Yeah, that's. I think that's what it means. Yeah, well... What, Why the S? News. Because there's more of it. I've got news. It's plural new. No. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the plural of new. Yeah, it is plur- pluralized new, isn't it? I mean, isn't that great? I've got news. I've got news. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Generic Drift with me, Harvey Broadhurst, and my entomological friend, Adam Bakewell. What do you think of that? Uh, it's all right, yeah. Oh, I thought you'd be more excited by that. Well, you know, I, I'm not... I wouldn't call myself an entomologist. No, but I would call you entomological. Okay, thanks. What, insect-like? Yeah, yeah. Which insect? A praying mantis. Oh, they're the worst ones. <laughs> I like them. I think they're awesome. Terrifying. I, I used to have um, praying mantises. I mantises. cannot believe that. You can't believe that. Like, why would anybody want to pray mantis as a pet? I think they're so scary. Oh, they're brilliant. They're, mm-hmm. they're really cool. And they're also really easy to look after, you know. They don't need much space. Oh, God. I'm not coming. <laughs> All right, well, you don't have to. <laughs> what have you been up to this week? Well, it was nice and sunny, wasn't it? So I was doing sunny activities. Mm. Um, I went down to St Albans for a committee meeting of the Royal Entomological Society. Oh, yes. That's yes, how entomological yes. I am. Yeah, exactly. You're very entomological. What happens at a committee meeting of the Royal Entomological Society? Um, you know, you just talk through what's coming up in the calendar and who's going to sort what out. And then there was a lovely spread and wine, even though it was only like half past one in the afternoon. Like, I, I thought that was a bit far, but it, yeah. was, it was nice. They had a huge sculpture of an ant outside oh. the front of it. Oh, cool. Uh, you would have really liked it. Like, it's a really cool place, like, in the middle of, you know, well, it's in St. Albans, so it's all in the middle of nowhere, basically. But Yeah, odd place to put the headquarters of the Royal Entomological Society, right? Well, it used to be, apparently, to start here, a, um, a butterfly park. Oh, you, okay. I don't know what the correct term for a butterfly park is, but, you know, like, they have loads of exotic species and stuff. Um mm. But then they ran out of money, and apparently the person who was in charge of winding it up was like, hmm, do you know anyone who's got use for this many hectares of land and a nice building and the Royal Entomological Society? We're like, yeah, we'll have it. And you had fun there? Um, well, I was basically sitting in a boiling hot train for three hours, sitting in mm. a meeting for an hour, and then sitting in a boiling hot train for three hours. So It was very hot, I remember. It was my um, dad ran the London Marathon. Uh, yes, I, I did know that. Mm. And um, we saw him at Mud Shoot, which is about 17 miles in. Yeah. Um, last year we tried to see, not last year, the year before when he ran it, um, we tried to see him, but we couldn't see him. <laughs> he just <laughs> went past us, apparently. Um, but this year we actually managed to get his attention and um, he came over. And at mile 17, he just sat on the ground and he was like, I don't think I could do this. Oh, bless him. Did he finish? He did finish. He what finished. was his time? I think it was five hours, 20 minutes. That's pretty good. It's really good considering yeah. how hot it was. Yeah. Because he, he did about four and a half hours last time he did it. But mm. this time the heat just, I think, drained everybody. Yeah, so, like yes. even the professional runners, like they were saying, like people didn't get their target times just because the weather was so extreme. Mm. Well, it was the hottest London marathon on record Are there any London marathons not on record? This is exactly my point, right? That's how The Sun described it. Yeah. The hottest London marathon on record. And I thought, well, like, that's just the hottest London marathon, right? It's only been going since the 1980s. We had thermometers. I brought this up at work thinking I was being really clever. And my colleagues were just like, oh, it's just a turn of phrase. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, well, it's being used incorrectly. Exactly. That's exactly my point. Since records began... (laughs) Yeah, it's ridiculous, isn't it? So there's five new species of hermit crabs. There's five new species of hermit crabs? Five new species of hermit crabs. Is that because they have discovered a species that they thought was one species is actually five? It's a different species. 
Uh, so I think that one of the ones they've discovered is, uh, like you say, it was just thought to be a currently existing species, uh, and the other four are completely novel, completely newly described to science. Cool. Okay. Like in the same place. So. Where whereabouts are these crabs? Where do they hail from? It's not Scarborough, is it? Because that would throw it's... some <laughs> issues into my research paper. It's the Indo-West Pacific. Oh, okay. Around the Philippines, places like that. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So no, not Scarborough. Excellent. <laughs> So, yeah, the species that uh, was known to science already, the one that one of the new ones was thought to be, was discovered uh, 130 years ago by a marine biologist, you know, just out exploring the world, doing that very naturalist thing from days Mm -hmm. gone by. Oh, I wish I could have done that, to be honest. I know. Well, I mean, I don't personally, but I know that you would wish that you could do it. (laughs) Yeah, I do. Just the exploring, the finding things. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, they do say the best place to find a new species is in your back garden. But I don't have a back garden. I've got a balcony. Well, that'll do. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah, so 130 years ago, they discovered it. And it's it's quite special because, as you know, you're, you're, you're a bit of an expert. Most hermit crabs uh, collect a shell and use a shell, yeah? Mm-hmm. I think all hermit crabs do, right? Well, no. Oh, this... Okay. So this has got a symbiotic relationship with sea anemones. Mm -hmm. All five species do. So it um, gets a sea anemone attached to its uh, back near its, I wouldn't call it a tail, but, you know, like tail area. Yeah, it's vent. Yeah, and it uses, instead of a shell, this sea anemone that grows up with it as it it grows. And it has two specialised little claws so that when it's in danger or when it thinks that, it's in danger. It pulls the sea anemone over its head like a blanket. Right. Okay. I'm struggling to understand this. So it's it's a a hermit crab. Yes. That doesn't have a shell. It has an anemone. It has an anemone instead. Yes. And then okay. And then it can essentially withdraw into the anemone. Well, so the anemone is quite thin, but obviously it provides protection because. You don't want to be touching an enemy. Mm. Um, so it it doesn't retreat into it. It pulls, literally pulls it over itself with, with two claws. Okay. They're called blanket hermit crabs because it's very like, you know, sitting in bed pulling the blanket up over your face. Right, okay. So this is a, a like, um, a stinging anemone. Well, I would assume so. Otherwise, it's not very useful, is it? Because... I guess, yeah. Can you send me a picture? Let's see the picture and I will obviously include in the show notes for anybody because I feel like I can't visualise this anemone. Well, it looks more like a crab than an anemone. It looks like a very soft-bodied crab. Okay. But you'll get the, you'll get the drift. Oh, my word. Okay. Yeah, so I was expecting it to have tentacles. So this thing actually just looks like whoa, like a glob. Yeah, well, yes, it does. It just looks like a glob. But it looks like the crab could withdraw within it. It it actually looks just like the anemone is the shell, effectively. Exactly. Yeah, so I was expecting, like, just an anemone plonked on the crab's back, but this actually anemone looks like a sort of cave that the crab could withdraw in, and maybe he can draw the, the top of it over his head, as you say. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. There's no maybe about it. This is science. All right, okay. And did nobody know about this? Is this a new species? Uh, so, no. Well, they knew about the one species of it, but there have been five more described five recently. More. Okay, I see. Okay. Uh, so, I just... Yeah, it's not something that I'd ever heard of, even the one species that have been described before. Like, I just naturally assume that all hermit crabs went around, found a shell and used that, like... It's interesting because the fact that a hermit crab is able to utilise shells from other creatures like gastropods and the benefit of that is once the crab grows large enough and it outgrows the shell, it can go and find another shell, um, either from one that another hermit crab is in or one that has been vacated or whatnot. Um, Mm -hmm. The thing with this appears to me that this hermit crab can't just 
hop out of this anemone and then go find another anemone, right? Because they're both reliant upon one another. Um, I don't know whether the crab would die if you pulled the pulled it out of the anemone. Mm. I think the anemone might. Yes. Well, but I don't know. Maybe. I think. Could the anemone just attach onto a rock or something? I don't know. The anemone grows with the crab, so it's like you don't need to go and find a new ah, shell. Of course, okay. Yeah. Because, the you know, a shell's not alive, whereas an anemone can grow just as much as a crab can. Mm. Easier, in fact. That is really interesting. So, yeah. so, but then that sort of begs the question, when a baby hermit crab is born, how does it go and find one of these anemones? If they're both growing with one another together for life and they're, you know, essentially living in this um, symbiotic relationship, where does it find the baby anemones that are the right size? I assume that some breeding goes on between... <laughs> I don't know how anemones reproduce at all, actually, so I don't, I don't feel comfortable um, having a guess, but... I'm not actually that familiar with how crabs breed. <laughs> well, just big. Just larva? Yeah, you know what? I don't know how crabs breed. That's email in. Email in. If you know how crabs and or anemones breed, please do let us know. That'd be great. I was an anemone at a party recently. You were, and that was an amazing costume. So I just went with classic uh, clownfish uh, anemone commensal interaction. Mm. Had I have known that this hermit crab species exists, I would have just turned up in a blanket. <laughs> Yeah. Pulling it over my head all night saying it's an anemone. <laughs> it was good. It was a very good costume, your costume. I will. You, there's a little gif, isn't there, doing the rounds. I will, yes. I'll put that in the show notes for anybody who's interested because it is a fantastic fancy dress costume. Just a quick recap from last episode. Obviously, I had some pigeon problems. The pigeons mm. were eating all of the seed at my bird feeder um, and that was scaring all the little songbirds away, which was not ideal. So what I've done is I've bought a new bird feeder. And with the new bird feeder, it's still it's still like the old one in that the old one attaches to um, a window with suction cups. But for this one, mm -hmm. the top and bottom of the feeder, as in that the um, shelter is the top and the bottom is the seed tray, effectively, they're separate pieces. Yeah. So you can actually lower and raise the top until you find the right height to keep out the larger birds. So it lets the songbirds in and keeps the pigeons and crows and magpies and whatnot out. Mm -hmm. I would have thought that uh, if, if they're sitting on a table, then a pigeon would have been strong enough to knock it off the suction cups. No, they're very strong suction cups. Mm, gotcha. Very strong suction cups, yeah. So I did this and I left the tiniest little gap that I thought the songbirds could get in, but the pigeons couldn't. And yeah. unfortunately, the pigeons were still getting in. <sighs> yeah and i've got i've got a video actually that i'll put in the show notes of this pigeon um it's unbelievable you wouldn't believe how it's managing to access this seed but anyway you know i i would believe it like there's a reason that pigeons are so successful yeah, they're, they're genius birds people say they're stupid yeah. i have not experienced stupid pigeons i've experienced very clever pigeons so we yeah. should give them a little bit more credit I, I give them, you know, as much credit as I think they deserve. Like, for an animal to be that successful, that widespread, and not exploited in some way. Like, obviously, chickens are, in air quotes, more successful, because mm. there are more of them. Yeah. But they're, they're successful through their own exploitation, whereas pigeons, are oh, they're just living it all. Yeah, it's domestication versus feralism. Is it feralism? They're feral, aren't they? They live in the wild, yeah, well, but they are them, yeah. from a domestic species. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, I have now moved the roof of the bird feeder so that it is so close to the seed tray that I have watched pigeons and they can't get in. Okay, awesome. But I also think a problem now is that the small birds can't get in either. Uh, so you haven't spotted any small birds attempted? No, but it took a few days before they started approaching the feeder last time. And I haven't yeah. been in. Um, and I, this, this feeder has only been up for about a week, I think. So... We'll see. I'll keep people updated, don't you worry. Okay, get set up a webcam and live stream that it. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. 
I would love. To, I would. Well, love not to. if not if no birds can eat from the bird food. It'd just be a very boring, boring web, cat, yeah. web stream of your balcony. The reason I talk about these pigeons is not just to talk about my bird feeder, but because I've got some cool bird news. Okay. Are you familiar with the Birds of Paradise? Yes. You are? I've seen them on uh, Attenboroughs and things, yeah. So Attenborough is really fond of them. He talks about them quite often in his biography. Um, yeah. Because obviously in his earlier years, he used to head out on little adventures, you know, doing a bit of exploring, like we were talking about. And... Um, um, and he would make documentaries in all sorts of exotic locations while he was collecting creatures for London Zoo. Yeah. Zoo Quest, I think the show was called. But uh, I digress anyway. So Birds of Paradise, it's a family of birds. You're familiar, but I'll tell our listeners who aren't familiar. There's about 40 different species, almost all of which are native to Papua New Guinea. And they're very well known for their really diverse, colourful and elaborate plumage. I'll put some examples of my favourite Birds of Paradise uh, species in the show notes. So being so beautiful, uh, Birds of Paradise were quite sought after in Europe, where ladies would wear their feathers in their hats and so on. And also many of the native tribes of New Guinea use their plumes in their various rituals and cultural dress, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, But the reason I bring them up is that although they're known for this vivid, colourful feathers, uh, some scientists have been looking at their black plumage instead. Oh, I did see this. Did you see this? This is yes. yeah, This is not a very new piece, but I did think it was really interesting. So their black feathers are incredibly, intensely black. Blacker than black. Very, very yeah. black. And the researchers wanted to know how these feathers managed to be quite so black. So what they did is they looked at the microscopic structure of the feathers and compared them to the feathers of the blackbird which, Mm -hmm. despite its name, is apparently not very black, not compared to the birds of paradise anyway. Yeah. So under the microscope, you can see, and I've got some images of these, um, the little branches on blackbird feathers lie flat and overlap one another, which creates this kind of flat-like surface that light can quite easily bounce off of. Yeah. Whereas the feathers for the birds of paradise are kind of curled and stick up, And the way the researchers talk about this is it's like a minute forest of trees, tiny little trees. And so when the light hits these feathers... Bob Ross. (laughs) Happy little, happy little feathers. So when the light hits these feathers, it bounces around and gets caught up in all of these tiny structures, gradually getting more and more absorbed into these little pits. So by trapping the light, the feathers can ensure they are super black. Yeah, it's something like 90, I read it last week, but I can't remember the statistic, like 99% of light is absorbed by the feathers or something, isn't it? I'll tell you how much. (laughs) So blackbird feathers um, reflect 3.2 to 4.7% of light. Yeah, still not much. Whereas the bird of paradise only reflects 0.05 to 0.3%. So they absorb up to 99.95% of light. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of light. Yeah, that's light. Yeah, so what's what's the function of it being this black then? Before we go on to the function, because I do have that, are you familiar with Vantablack? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, it's it's another of these things that, like, I've read about in the past. Mm. Um, And I was like, well, it looks black to me. (laughs) Yeah, I think you need to see it in person to appreciate how dark it is. But it's the darkest artificial substance ever created. And it reflects 99.965% of light. Absorbs. Yeah, sorry. It absorbs 99.965% of light. So very slightly more than the Bird of Paradise feathers. But just very, very slightly. Bird of Paradise are almost there. And what Vantablack consists of is lots of vertically arranged carbon nanotubes, which, similarly to the feathers, trap the light. So the birds of paradise feathers essentially do the same thing, but with biological material and through evolution. Wow. Feathers, though, like surely the filaments of a feather are so much... Well, obviously, everything's on such a small scale, but compared to a carbon nanotube, which really are tiny... Mm -hmm. 
surely like the, the individual filaments of a feather are so much bigger. Like it's surprising that that's how close they get. Yeah, I don't know how small carbon nanotubes are. Are they incredibly small? Well, I'm, I'm assuming. I don't are. want to say that they're just a uh, sheet of carbon atoms, are they? They might be. So they're a carbon atom thick, which is <laughs> very small. Yeah. Wow. Wow. If that's true. And well, we only did about to A level physics, uh, A level chemistry. Sorry. Mm. So that's my recollection from then. Okay. Okay. I um, we had to come up with a worksheet explaining carbon nanotubes, and. I, the back of my worksheet was these hexagons with little circles at the vertex of each hexagon. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the instruction was, roll up the piece of paper, he's got a carbon nanotube. Some of my best work. That is, that's brilliant. You're a genius. I know, well, there we are. Nice. What did you get for that? Uh, nothing, but she liked it. <laughs> I was like, what is the use of carbon nanotubes, really? Well, now you know. Well. What, absorbing light? Yeah, well, can you think of some applications? Uh, tennis rackets. Why tennis rackets? Why would a tennis racket... Well, I don't think that's light? nanotubes, but I think that's like, you know, the sheets of... To, to make them really lightweight and strong. Ah, uh, okay. Right. No. That was one of her examples of a good use for... Uh, carbon nanotechnology and I was like well you don't need that though do you no I don't think that that does sound like a very good application tennis rackets yeah exactly not you know it's not it's not changing the world is it I've got some examples that would change the world well so scientists say it could help solar panels collect more light because it would absorb more yeah yeah um, but yeah. not if so the, but the reason that the it absorbs more is because like the energy is lost within the maze of uh particle uh, the filaments yeah yeah so is the idea that you would make like nano Fil- yeah panels yeah effectively I, I think that that that's the way i sort of thought of it when it's bouncing around it's not being absorbed by things that can't then convert that into energy but rather the tubes and bristles or whatever you want to call them they would absorb the light themselves and convert that into energy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's no, that's a good one. Also, orbital telescopes. You know, I like a telescope. I know you like a telescope. They well, can, no, so what's so what's they that? could use the technology to ensure that um, stray light is absorbed, so that they can focus more clearly on deep space objects. Okay. Only absorb the light from a very very small point of space. Yeah. Yeah. And also just generally improving camouflage, maybe for military vehicles um, and stuff like that. Uh, well, but then if we're getting into colour, which is what that is, yeah. Mm-hmm. Black is black. Mm-hmm. Like the blackbird does all right being black. It's yeah. managed to survive. It's managed to get off Papua New Guinea. I know it was never there, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's not restricted to a small island. Neither are birds of paradise. They are found oh, in Australia and Indonesia as well. It's just the majority are in uh, PNG. And do they all have these ultra black feathers? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure if they all do. Um, some of them, some of them do. But uh, I still don't think you've told me why they've got this adaptation. Then why do you think? Why would they need incredibly black feathers? I don't think they do. No. Go on then, why why do they need it? So, by combining the super black feathers with vivid colours like hot pinks and electric blues, it emphasises the bright colours and makes them really pop out. Okay. So it's essentially placing their brightest, most vivid colours in a context that makes them appear even brighter and even more magnificent. So that when they do um, courtship and attract mates... Yeah. They look phenomenal. So it's just a sexual thing, then. Yeah, it's so yeah. like when I was when I was talking about adaptation. So like sexual adaptation is something a bit different, like aren't they? So you wouldn't say a peacock needs to have a huge tail. It's just it happens that the the most attractive males over time have been the ones with the biggest tails. Like 
Yeah, it doesn't but, serve a purpose than but, being. Well, I, I, I would disagree because now that we do have peacocks with those colours, the peacock does need those colours. So because there has already existed peacocks with those colours, you know, it, it's. I mean, it's exactly the same as fighting, right? Like a male lion needs to be really tough because it needs to be able to fight off other male lions. Yeah, but but what I was just saying is like the that it hasn't evolved in loads and loads of species. Mm-hmm. But, but it tells you something about its actual functional use, and that's not much. No, like well, it might as well just be black. Well, I mean, it's it's a point. There are a couple of other species that the scientists say use this um, sort of nanotube biological nanotube tech <laughs> yeah um and that's the gaboon viper which is i think an african species it's a very very heavy viper i think the heaviest viper in the world and it also has the longest teeth yeah um and that uses this vanta black to as camouflage yeah well i was going to say like obviously something nocturnal if you're not reflecting any light at night you're not going to be seeing like you're just going to be so that was the kind of functional thing yes. I was looking for with it. Yeah, that's true. So I think the, the Gaboon Viper isn't just covered in black. It has little bits of black all over it, which help it camouflage within um, into the leaf litter on the floor. Mm-hmm. And then also more within your remit, butterflies as well. Yeah. Apparently there's some butterfly species that have this intense black coloration. But I don't, I don't think it's that good camouflage. It works in those species, but when you consider all the animals and all the camouflages that there are, yeah. being green is still better than being ultra black. Yeah. And be, it, there yeah. are loads of things that hunt at night or, you know, just live at night and avoid being hunted at night. And there are very few things that are, are ultra black. So to me, this this uh, the the conclusion is, you know, you might as, if you're going to be, you, you, you might as not well bother with ultra black, really. Well, maybe not for camouflage, although I think many could quarrel with that. But I think for the the bird of paradise, it does make these things look brighter. It does make them look more magnificent. It's, you know, arguably the reason that people um, even were attracted to using their feathers in the first place. It's not because if they were just entirely electric blue, maybe they would be desirable, but they wouldn't be quite so desirable because their feathers are placed in the context of this super black, un- almost unnatural black that you don't mm. really see. Well, you see in very few places in the natural world. That's what makes them so magnificent. That's what makes these birds so beautiful. And that's impressive, you know? Yeah. And also one one other little thing um, that Birds of Paradise are known for are these quite elaborate courtship dances that they do. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so looking at this um, this super black as well and how it works, the function of um, the light being absorbed, the bird quite famously always positions itself right in front of its mate or its potential mate. And by positioning itself there, the male bird of paradise can ensure that the microscopic barbules and spikes are pointing directly at the female. And this is the position wherein the black looks most black because the light's travelling straight into it, whereas it's more likely to bounce off the side. So that's also one of the driving factors for creating these really cool dances. Mm. I love it. Yeah, it's it's nice. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go out and seek Vanta Black. (laughs) Okay. Well, yeah. I'm just as taken with these birds as David Attenborough is. Well, maybe if I saw one in person, I'd be like, oh my God, that's so black. I think that's the thing about this black. We're only looking at through our computer screens, right? And yeah. That's always going to, that's never going to be as black as the real thing. So, but it's rendered with light. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the picture coming out of your computer screen, black isn't an absence of light. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. So, yeah. Maybe I'll get some in, in my garden, some birds of paradise. Yeah, well, certainly have a go if you move to Papa. <laughs> they might not fit in the feeder, though. How do we know what humans hunted in the past? How do we know? Yeah, what, what, how do we know what animals humans hunted in the past? There's, I think there's obviously some direct 
evidence in that whenever you find bones of ancient humans and hominids you will also find bones of say i don't know mammoths or prey animals yeah yeah exactly prey animals um and then also i would say another way is by looking at the fossilized remains of prey animals that appear to have been attacked by sophisticated equipment tools yeah yeah mm-hmm. tools so i would say in the fossil record there is some evidence and then also i think you need to look at how modern day humans what sort of animals we eat today and then what animals would have existed in the same locations as humans in the past or ancient hominids and then you could make some assumptions about the sort of animals that they probably would have hunted and eaten. Yeah. Um, I can't really think of any other ways, but I'm sure. Well, then, are. so the way that immediately jumped to my mind was like art. Yeah. So humans have been recording their own history for a very long time. Uh, you know, so if you see a picture of a man with a spear hunting a bear, then you know that we're hunting bears. Yeah. Okay. But. So this evidence is the first of its kind, though, this this new evidence. So all the things you've described are sort of indirect ways of how we figured out what we hunted, yeah? Yes. And this is another one, one of those. But So this is fossilised tracks. Oh, okay. So fossilised tracks uh, that indicate predation are very rare. I, I was quite shocked to hear that this was the, the first evidence of human hunting that have been found in fossilized tracks i can imagine that though because what what do you mean by tracks like footprints well, yeah footprints footprints that are then followed by human footprints yes okay well i'll i'll, uh, I'll explain so these um were uncovered uh well i say uncovered they could only be seen in certain conditions of moisture so that's why we didn't just see them and think, oh, some footprints here. This is another animal that humans were hunting. Um, and they're from the late Pleistocene. Oh, yeah. So that's like, uh, this is from about 10 to 15,000 years ago. Uh-huh. So really old. Um, and it's of humans hunting giant ground sloths. Oh, megatherium. Well, not megatherium. You know, I love megatherium. So these are two different uh, genesis, uh well, it could be one of two different genesis. Like, obviously, from a footprint, it's... Genera. You know, it's, sorry, genera. <laughs> uh, from a 10,000-year-old footprint, it's quite hard to narrow it down. But So it's either Nothrotheriops okay. or Paramylodon. Okay. So they're both a bit smaller than Megatherium. South but America, like... though? Uh, no, uh, North America. Oh, okay. Uh, New Mexico, I believe. The okay. Tracks were discovered in. So they're a bit smaller than Megatherium, but still like bear sized, bigger than a human, about three meters long or something. Mm-hmm. And so the sloth tracks, they move um, when, when the human footprints are present, they move in a more curved pattern, sometimes to the extent that they're completely circular. Right. What do you and mean? As in the the path that they're treading yes wow so they managed to uncover a whole trail yeah well several what? lots of and several and from two different species so and we can tell as well other things from the way that the human footprints are spaced out that that this wasn't just um a ground sloth walking across and then a couple of weeks later a human also walked across like you can tell that the human is running Oh. And because of the space in between the steps, like and the human gait. How do you know the ground sloth isn't hunting the human? Well, it's doing a pretty bad job of it if it's just going round and round in a circle, isn't it? Well, the, yeah, but if the human's doing that, um, well, because they don't eat meat. Oh yeah, I guess they don't eat avocados. So that's that's one good reason that we know it's not hunting humans. Uh, so obviously. Like I say, it's indirect evidence. Like the the human, one of the things they say in the paper is that the humans could have just been playing with yeah. <laughs> this three meter bare side sloth. Yeah, just chasing but, it around for a laugh. Yeah, I mean, whether you'd chase around something with huge claws mm. as a laugh, I I, I don't know. Mm. But it's certainly evidence of 
some sort of interaction. I can't believe that is like that evidence has been left behind. Do you want to see the pictures? Yes, please. Okay. Oh, so there's pictures of the footprints. Um, well, they're not the clearest thing in the world, but I, you know, they're as you would expect. But you can see, um, you can see the tracks, and you, you can see very distinctly what is human and what is uh, sloth as well. Like it'll be in the show notes, I suspect. Of course. Wow. What? How? So you can only see these tracks when the the moisture conditions are very specifically right. Uh, you can see it's in so the bo- the bottom picture. See, it's labelled. Yeah. That's what well, they call it the flailing circle. So it's running around. So it's well running around or walking around. However, a, a creature that big moves, and it's reaching forward with its arms, its forelimbs. And leaving um, impressions with its knuckles or claws in the ground as well as feet, yeah? What? So can you see that there are some that are very clearly circles of, like, feet? Yeah. And then bigger, like, yeah. uh, gouges that are claw from the claws. Claw knuckle marks. This is crazy. So, so the interaction in panel C, is that where the humans are actually with? The sloth? I don't think you can see any human footprints oh, in that one. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, but you can see that it's being, hmm. you know, it's it's having a, a bit of a mare. It's running around just yeah. <laughs> in a circle, banging the floor like. Yeah. It looks, it looks like this would be the marks that would be left by something that was scared. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So I'm assuming, because I was thinking... When, when we were talking about tracking, I was thinking that maybe the humans were following these footprints, but it it actually looks, I would say, like the humans are very, very close. Yeah, the, no, the humans are following the sloth. Well, I mean, it's hard to miss them. Yeah. A three-metre giant sloth. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I thought it was, I thought the humans were being a bit more, they were being clever. They were like, oh, I've got the trail of a, of a ground sloth, like, follow me. But it actually, yeah. I would probably say maybe this could be they've seen a giant ground sloth and run after it yeah exactly yeah, that's the sort of interaction until we're it, looking at maybe until it gets so um fraught i don't know <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling to find words that you use in relation to animals to describe mm. their panic but so until it's you know either exhausted or chased after it so that you can take it out yeah because get a get a weapon in there get a tool into yeah. it yeah Wow. So, but isn't this amazing? Like, this was ten to 15,000 years ago these tracks were made, and they're still visible now, and we can use them to elucidate things about behavioural ecology, like, that's what it is, essentially. Yeah. It's a piece of behavioural ecology news about humans, like... I think this is amazing. I think it's amazing that this, this um, interaction of ancestral humans and a giant ground sloth has been imprinted so that yeah we can clearly infer what happened in this incident yeah. from the markings that were inadvertently left in the ground yeah. it's it's this is probably the finest example of footprints being left behind and what we can draw from that that i've ever seen yeah it's it's, it's just it is incredible because I, I always think of, like, behavioural things. So I am kind of a behavioural ecologist. But I would never have guessed that this kind of evidence could have been found in this kind of way. No, I can't believe it's been preserved like this. Mm-hmm. Especially as in panel A on the image that you've supplied, this is, like, for people who aren't looking at these images, it's in, like, a desert or a plain. Well, it is now. Yeah, but to to think about how exposed that is to the environment. Yeah. And it, it's not like the ground looks really, really solid mm-hmm. either. <laughs> the ground looks quite sandy. It looks a bit moony. <laughs> yeah, it does look a bit moony. It's it's crazy that this has been preserved. Oh, so to, to be clear, like some of these, uh, so in panel A and things like that, they, are, they haven't been excavated. Like obviously in C and E, they've been dug out a bit so that you can actually see the pattern but you know archaeologists know what they're doing yeah 
Yeah, and then we've got a lot of images along the side of the image of all the different types of footprints. Yeah. No, this is incredible stuff. I mean, when I think of um, fossilised footprints, I think of things like um, growing up on the Isle of Wight in the Jurassic Coast or whatnot, we have lots of um, footprints from dinosaurs mm -hmm. that you can see in the rocks of some of the beaches. And I've seen some before, and it's it's quite impressive. I do really like it. But um, at the same time, you can barely register what's happening, and you might get two in a row, two, three maybe four, and then they just disappear, right? This, yeah. we've got a clear trail of footprints from two different species. I appreciate the time scale is completely different from this and mm -hmm. the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, the evidence that this has left behind is, is remarkable. Yeah. So I asked you at, at first to list the ways that we know about how humans hunted animals and what which anim animals humans hunted. Yeah. And so obviously there isn't in the world that we know of cave art or whatever of humans hunting these gi giant ground sloths i mean maybe there is but because as we've discussed in the past like cave art is a little bit shit. so maybe they were trying to draw a giant sloth but it looks like a bear that's like how we've interpreted it <laughs> yeah this kind of research it's just it tells us something about the past in a way that we we would never have known about without this specific evidence and it just makes you wonder like what else is out there that's potentially to be uncovered or perhaps never to be discovered at all. Like things mm. we just will never know. Mm. I want to go and do this. I want to do this now. I want to go out into the world and find more footprint interactions. Go on then. That's it. I'm handing my notice in on Monday. <laughs> I'm going looking for footprints. So this question might sound a little out there, a little bit wacky, quite conspiracy theorist. Theorist? I, would, I, well, I know we've got the same piece. <laughs> How would we know that there was never a civilization on Earth before humans? Oh, well, now that I've read the paper, it's, it's very hard for me to answer that um, <laughs> from the perspective that I would have done. I, I knew we would have the same piece. Well, this it, was, one. it is very interesting, so... I can't wait to hear your thoughts on it. I remember reading about it and thinking, this is nonsense. And then I read a little bit more. And the more I read, the more I was like, this is great. This is brilliant. Mm -hmm. So a couple of physicists, one guy at NASA called Gavin Schmidt, and another guy who wrote the article um, that I'll include in the show notes for The Atlantic. He's called Adam Frank, and he's a professor at the University of Rochester. Um, they've published a study called the Silurian hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to detect an industrial civilization in the geological record? So I know that this would have attracted you because I know you're a huge Doctor Who fan. That's very true. I am a huge Doctor Who fan. And I thought if you saw the Silurian hypothesis, you wouldn't be able to resist this piece. So, uh, uh, so we've both prepared. Well, they do episode. acknowledge in the footnote. Have you, have you read the, the paper itself? I've not read the paper. I've read an article about the paper. So they acknowledge on the first page, on, on in a footnote, uh, that, that they've named the hypothesis after the episode of Doctor Who, mm -hmm. not not the time period. Um, and they uh, put in a little disclaimer saying, uh, I'll read it verbatim, we are not, however, suggesting that intelligent reptiles actually existed in the Silurian age, nor that experimental nuclear physics is liable to wake them from hibernation. <laughs> I mean, isn't that hilarious? That like, is hilarious. On a journal article. That's the kind of thing that I want to write. Yeah, I like that. A little, I like a little bit of comedy and tongue-in-cheek in a mm -hmm. journal article. It's good. Okay, so I think it's important for us to explain, because we have to remember, Adam, not everybody listening is going to be a huge Doctor Who fan. Some people listening may have no interest in Doctor Who. That's, you know, it's possible. It is possible. I also want to um, preface this by saying I have no interest in Doctor Who. I think it is a rubbish show now. I, I used to like it back in the day, but it is rubbish. Yeah, okay. And it has been rubbish for a very long time. But anyway, mm -hmm. for context, the Silurians are a race, an intelligent race from Doctor Who lore, uh, in which they're like a reptilian 
a prehistoric reptilian intelligent race that lived in the ground. I think they call them Homo reptilius or something. Yeah, I would say the humanoid reptile, like the human shaped, but yeah. reptilian in every other respect, we're led to believe. Yeah, and in the show, I think they had the surface world before humans or something, um, before eventually retiring to the ground and there they remain in hibernation every few series they wake up and there's a rubbish episode about them mm -hmm. well the original episode is actually quite good is it yeah with john i don't Burley. remember uh, I, I don't think i've seen that one but yeah all right they're a classic like people like to see them revived like the daleks and the side yeah. yeah in the revived series the episodes are off one of them's called Cold Blood, I think, but um, they're written by Chris Chipnell, who's taken over Doctor Who mm. with the new female Doctor. So, mm. I mean, the episodes were rubbish. So I don't hold much hope, but uh, all right. <laughs> Again, not everyone's interested in Doctor Who. I'll leave it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is not what this piece is about. So that's literally just a little joke that they put in the title. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but it caught our attention for sure. Mm -hmm. I loved it. And um, essentially, I think we need to caveat this section of the show by explaining that neither of the scientists genuinely believe there was a civilization before humans. They're simply looking at what evidence would remain of a, uh, a an industrial civilization and how can we be certain that there wasn't one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So when I, when I saw, started reading this article the first thing that i think that I, that I thought of um and going back to a couple of things we discussed today is the fossil record yes you would assume that a civilization would leave traces in the fossil record but the researchers explain that only such a small fraction of life genuinely gets fossilized mm -hmm. and yeah that's true we struggle to understand how you know, the ancestors of humans left Africa. And that's on yeah. a time scale of just hundreds of thousands to a couple of millions of years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's true that perhaps something like this would be lost. Yeah, the Earth's been along, around for a very long time. And our Industrial Revolution has lasted like 200 years. Yeah, the, they would say on the first page that uh, complex life on Earth has existed for 400 million years. We know so little about most of those 400 million years. Yeah. And so what they're asking is, given the way that we are affecting the environment and, and having our imprint on the fossil record, the geological record, would we be able to spot if something like this had happened before? And not just on this planet, but potentially in the search for evidence for life on all different kinds of planets. Yeah, sure. Like Mars. Mm -hmm. mm. so uh, looking at us as an example say the human race died out tomorrow we would have yeah. had an industrial revolution that lasted like 200 years mm -hmm. um and civilization our civilization has lasted what like a few thousand years if that yeah so how much evidence do well, we really... Not, not if that. Let's let's not pretend that civilization hasn't existed for a couple of thousand years. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. We've got books that old. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right. More than... Okay, not if that. Not if that. <laughs> but uh, how much evidence do we truly believe will be would remain um, yeah. tens of millions of years from now? And so this is what the study goes on to. Um, and it looks at things like fertilizer, which we obviously use for the food that we need to supply mm -hmm. to our vast population. Um, and that because fertilizer is rich in nitrogen, that would leave residue or remains in sediment from this period. Mm -hmm. And they also mention rare earth elements, which we use in electronics. Um, these, again, should be overrepresented in our period's geology, uh, as well as plastics which is something yeah. that we're always being told how long plastic takes to break down. Yeah. Um, so all of these things should leave some sort of evidence in the substrates from our time. You've left out the most interesting ones, I think. Go on. What, what ones have you got? 
So I think that the um, balance of carbon isotopes yeah. is one of the central... Well, I won't spoil, like, the, the, find, the well, finding in air quotes of the paper, but, like, we are... We, ch- we change by burning fossil fuels and all, all sorts of things. The, the ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-13 yeah. in, uh, you know, on, on Earth. So that, that leaves a very distinct impression. Um, things like CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, that there are only some kinds that naturally occur on Earth and we, we generate synthetically new ones that you wouldn't find anywhere. Things like fossils of animals that have clearly been transported like uh rats and mice and cats and things yeah okay i agree with that one that one is interesting before yeah. you me- before you brought that up i was going to maintain i'd mentioned the most interesting things okay. isotopes no but, the, but okay <laughs> i'll come back to it yeah okay no that that is interesting i guess yeah when you because obviously uh, part of the work that we do we look at how animals have migrated and the fact that there's no kangaroo fossils, ancient kangaroo fossils in other continents other than Australia mm-hmm. is huge evidence for the theory of evolution, right? But yeah, uh, yeah when, once we start shipping things all around the world, yeah. Then, yeah, I guess that could only be explained by, well, intelligent civilization and complex logistics. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. I like that one. The reason I brought up things like fertilizer and rare earth elements and plastics um, is because all of these things are things that we associate with unsustainability. Yeah. And as our civilization heads towards more sustainability, we will leave presumably less of a footprint for those yeah. particular elements. If it's, you a, will. it's a paradox. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we'll leave less of an imprint on the environment because we're purposely uh trying to make less of a an imprint on the environment yeah yeah I and mean, we don't know that no civilization hasn't done that before like that's the the key thing isn't it that mm. these these mechanisms could all be self-regulating what if the previous civilization reached true sustainability or maintained yeah. true sustainability for so long that actually there is no evidence because that was what allowed them to thrive mm-hmm. mm. indeed very interesting maybe it's pigeons <laughs> they are clever <laughs> um one other thing i thought from this study which was really awesome i love this is the researchers described the possibility of fossil fuel driven cycles of civilization and collapse mm-hmm. so by using fossil fuels um we induce climate change and that decreases ocean oxygen levels which triggers the extinction of that civilization. Mm-hmm. But then crucially, these low oxygen levels in the ocean actually drive processes that create fossil fuels in the first place, like oil mm-hmm. and coal. Um, and that essentially sows the seeds for the next civilization. Well, so I think we should clarify as well that they term civilization um, in a very specific way. So even in the title, like it's referred to as an industrial civilization, yeah? Yeah. So they're looking for a signature that will be left in the geological record of a civilization that is really quite similar to ours. Mm -hmm. So obviously, uh, ancient Egyptians and things, they wouldn't have caused anything like the blip in, I'm going to bring up carbon isotopes again, because that's basically what you're talking about, (laughs) Um, that that we did. It would take um, a large-scale harnessing of the earth's resources to do to do this kind of signature mm-hmm. uh, so you, they define in a very specific way like what intelligent life is and what industrial civilization is there um so apparently the standard token definition of an industrial civilization uh, what we're looking for when we go out into space to find intelligent life is that they use radio waves to communicate is that right yeah well ap- apparently that's you know there's a reference that um, that is the definition wow okay it, because if if a, if a life form if a civilization hadn't done that then how would we expect to communicate with them yeah you know because it would just be like me trying to talk to even if dogs were super intelligent they're not going to be able to understand me yeah most humans can't understand me 
we all speak different languages. <laughs> yeah, and you you have a very difficult to understand accent. <sighs> well, <laughs> yes, I have been told that in the past. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they they don't use the radio wave um, thing because obviously. The, the use of radio waves for communication isn't going to leave a huge footprint in the geological record. Mm. So, yeah, they define an industrial civilization as the ability to harness external energy sources at a global scale. Yeah, I, th- I think that makes sense. Yeah. It all sort of begs the question, if we are... If we, if we use fossil fuels, mm-hmm. we harness energy at a global scale we are in an industrial revolution. But if we create such conditions through climate change that we can no longer thrive anymore and it ends in our demise, then have we sowed the seeds for the next civilization? Are we the first in a chain of civilizations? So we're talking about like in a couple of million years, the new intelligent life form comes along, um, would they know, even if they develop the same techniques as us to look at the geological record and things, would they think there was a species that did this damage to the environment? Or would they just be like, oh, it's you know probably a system of volcanoes? Yeah. Um, just an extinction event. Just an extinction event. Just, uh, you know... The plastics and things and the rare earth elements, they're things that are kind of much harder to uh, explain. But as I say, these are very specific to the human signature, right? Yeah. There's, there's no saying that any other civilization, let's, let's just say they exist, have invented plastics. Yeah. You know? There's no, there's no saying that even if we were eradicated humans, yeah. that this niche would ever be exploited again. Yeah. Because... Mm-hmm. Is it is our niche as humans, as intelligent life, creating industrial revolution, harnessing energy on a global scale? Are we as as desirable as niche as, as we put emphasis on? Because I I don't, I don't know if that's true. Because we could honestly just be uh, as as specific in our own behaviour as a hermit crab with an a, an anemone on its back. Yeah. And if we wiped out all of the hermit crabs with anemones on their back, do we really think that another species would do that? No. Do you see the, well, you know, do you see the point it, I'm trying to make? It's like civilization. I think a lot of people would think of this and think of when humans are gone, that means that another civilization can rise. Has the freedom to... But yeah, so to take over the world, Yeah. if... The way a rat would take over the world is very different to the way that humans have taken over the world. Yeah. But I think that's about intelligence, surely, yeah? Yeah. I like, rats are... I'm going to go out and say it. Rats are never going to use radio waves to <laughs> talk to one another. Not unless we make them. <laughs> make them. Well, yeah, you know, in a lab. Yeah, we could do that. We probably already are doing that, somebody in some lab. <laughs> yeah i know what you mean so well they use the drake equation do you know the drake equation i don't know the drake equation so it's a an equation for estimating the number of um community com- uh, communicative that's a word yeah yeah communicative extraterrestrial civilizations in the milky way and it's a function of like how many planets there are in the mil- visible Milky Way, how many of those planets have the the right temperature or whatever, the um, environmental conditions that life could grow on, um, and then the probability of, given the time that the planet has existed, that life will begin at all, or intelligent life will begin, or technology would have been developed, Yeah, yeah. The Drake equation is what people talk about when they say, given the size of the universe, surely other intelligent life is around. Yeah. It's a really difficult thing to understand because Mm -hmm. intelligent life, again, like I say, intelligent life, I don't know whether there really is this draw for things to become intelligent because... Yeah. Well, they talk about dolphins in the paper. Mm -hmm. Like... 
it's disputed. I know that's a bit Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Like these people are obviously big sci-fi fans. Whatever we find probably won't have human intelligence. No, I don't even think it will have intelligence. I don't even think it will have intelligence. I think what we what we consider intelligence is so restricted to such a limited our limited perspective of what animals and life is we mm-hmm. have such little like a, a little understanding of the potential of what life could be because everything is based upon the same fundamental structure of cells yeah. and animals and plants, dna bacteria exactly viruses that we don't even understand you know exactly and those very distinct things have evolved on earth and look at the diversity we have now yeah and that's incredible but imagine the diversity we would have in i don't know another billion years like it's 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 crazy and to put that in the context of a different planet under completely different conditions the mm-hmm. sorts of things mm-hmm. that would evolve there would be so far from our understanding that i think intelligence is just well the brain probably wouldn't evolve yeah exactly maybe the, the likelihood of brains evolving or eyes they wouldn't use um you know eyes to interpret photons and light signals in order to yeah. navigate they might not you know they've it's possible they wouldn't have something like that. It's probable they wouldn't because it's probable mm-hmm. that they wouldn't have the same DNA. They probably wouldn't use yeah. the same sort of, you know, basic fundamentals of what we interpret as life. And all of mm-hmm. these things are built on top of existing building blocks as determined by evolution. Mm-hmm. So the point, <laughs> the point that I'm trying to make is that I think intelligent life is, <laughs> it's so overemphasized and it's so it's so it, because it's what we consider to be the pinnacle of of life and the most amazing thing that life has ever produced i think that people that's why people think that there must be something similar to that out there but yeah but then at the same time i don't know because you've also got to consider the vastness of space and the in fact the amount of planets there are planets and exactly. solar systems and everything like you've got to the, the thing is about them talking back, like that's what we want, yeah? Mm-hmm. We want them communicating back. And so you've got to think about the likelihood that if intelligence has uh, evolved somewhere else, are they seeking us as well? Yeah. I think that's what makes it interesting. Like, sure, if we found like an alien, well, I'm not even going to call it a plant, but, you know, an alien sessile <laughs> organism. Mm-hmm. Nice. That Stationary. Traps stationary yeah that traps um sunlight and use it in some way to grow and develop like it'd be a, you know earth shaking but it wouldn't you know people wouldn't be excited about it to talk to it <laughs> yeah no you're right you are you right you wouldn't even try you're no you're absolutely correct because who do we want to talk to? We don't talk to anything. We talk to ourselves. We talk to one species out of the millions of species that exist. Well, what? I think, as you may have heard on Generic Drift, we also talk to a killer whale. <laughs> yeah, episode three, I think that was. I think so. Overambitious seagull, I think. Yeah. If not, try them all out. <laughs> The thing is, the thing is, when we when we go back to um, because the universe is so vast, we expect to see something like this out there. It mm-hmm. it simply is a fact of the universe and galaxies that exist being so enormous that we are dealing with numbers that our tiny primate brains are not able to compute. And we're also you've also got to remember we're talking about over the whole space of uh, the whole time. Sorry. Mm. Since the universe began. Mm-hmm. So I think the likelihood of us overlapping with another intelligent, communicative civilization, I mean, it's very minuscule, isn't it? I don't know, because again, it depends. Time is obviously one dimension, and that's that's huge, but also we have space. And if we've got so much space that there's there's so many there's so many planets out there. And there's them, you know, if there's billions, trillions of planets that could potentially harbour life, mm-hmm. then maybe, maybe there is intelligent life. I don't know. It, it, I, w- I want somebody to do this actual computation. Is that what this Drake's equation is? Yes. 
it's it's you know i know you don't like equations but <laughs> no well i've just they they confuse me um, my brain is is more primitive than most yeah i mean this this paper <laughs> <Don't agree. laughs> sorry this paper it challenges some of the assumptions of the drake equation right so um the likelihood of t technology or a technological civilization um developing this paper they say well we only have a sample size of one right yeah yeah humans and what this paper says is well you, you can't base your equation on that because in a million years time and more than a million years you know a couple of million years time the next hypothetical uh industrial civilization wouldn't would still have a sample size of one they still they wouldn't have the human data point it would have been lost yeah to the geologic record yeah and okay. that's what i thought was i mean it's just a, a thought experiment a little hypothesis thing but i just and it was it was really well written and i thought it was really interesting perfect for the show oh it's it's all a bit of fun isn't it really yeah and there's arguably not enough of that in science but mm -hmm. i love i just love it when questions like this come up because it it sounds like absolute nonsense yeah. And and it is in a way, but there is some really interesting science behind it and it helps us understand certain things. If mm -hmm. we can't work out whether there was another civilization on our planet, on our evolutionary line, then how the hell are we going to find something somewhere else? I think else? they're suggesting that this was before our evolutionary life. No, sorry, I just mean the evolution of life on Earth. Okay, yeah. I don't just mean humans. Our evolutionary yeah. line goes all the way back to single-celled organisms, right? Yeah. So, I wasn't saying right for you to correct that because I do know that that's true for a fact. But um, <coughs> I do want to mention something because in the last episode, and I left it in because it was a laugh, but I did say DNA is not a wavelength, is it? Yeah. <laughs> and that's the stupidest thing I think I've ever said in my life. <laughs> well, I think you said DNA is not a wave. Oh, I might have said that. Yeah. Nothing's a wavelength. <laughs> you have a wavelength. Yeah, okay. Um, I also loved the acknowledgements of this paper um, that said, it opened with, no funding has been provided nor sought for this study. Nice. They've just done it for their, in their spare time. They've literally just done it because, you know, they know about things and they want to share their thoughts that is, with their yeah, community. That is true science. It is. It's, it's a beautiful thing. I'm going to be keeping an eye on the International Journal of Astrobiology. Yeah. No, that's a good idea. Perhaps they can sponsor the show. Yes. <laughs> Sponsored by the Journal of... What is it? In International Journal of Astrobiology. <laughs> Astrobiology, what like a fascinating area to work in. That is a really, really cool area. And to think of how primitive it is at the moment, even with mm -hmm. all the technology we have behind it, mm -hmm. to think of how far away we probably are from actually discovering real, true astrobiology. Mm -hmm. It's cool. It's great. It's great. Are, we, are these guys the Isaac Newtons of astrobiology? Who knows? Um, are you going to say no? No, <laughs> no they're not, are they? <laughs>